hi friends welcome on board our new life plan um we're going on to chapter 25 and this is day 25 so we are excited as always um because slowly slowly we're winding this down we've got more than half we're getting closer to the end and it feels really exciting but one thing i can tell you though it's it's been extremely empowering for me and i'm hoping it's been empowering for you as well so let's just go straight into it because um, again time is of the essence we don't like wasting too much of your time and we equally um are putting so much time into this is already past 11 our time so very soon it'll be midnight and then we don't want to really keep staying up that late anyway so Today's one is called Transformed by Trouble. And if you're joining us for the first time, this is the book we're looking at. It's called The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. Um, Transformed by Trouble is the title of this chapter. So it says, first our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And this is 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 17. And the next verse he normally gives us is, It is the fire of suffering that brings forth the gold of godliness. So, I can connect with that. What he's trying to say there is, um, you know when they say gold goes through fire before it becomes gold? So, here he's saying the fire of suffering is when you suffer that you get the gold of godliness. And this was written by someone called Madame Guignon. So that's, that's the direction we're going today, is we are transformed by trouble. And I, when I was reading this, I felt so excited about it. You are going to be so amazed at what is coming out of this chapter. So God has a purpose behind every suffering. Now this is a really good one. God has a purpose behind every suffering. And you remember the reason I decided to read this book? It started from me going through quite a lot of mental stress, um, uh, struggling with my business growing, struggling with my, um, my, my family life, um, having problems with my husband, uh, and then, you know, moving to a different location and not having the comfort of the kind of home you're used to. And so all of this all joined up and just led me to a point where I didn't know what I was doing anymore. And um, one of the things I realized today is since I took on this book, it's been like that experience of um, soldiers going to war where things get so tough at the war front and they just stop and retreat. They call it retreat. So they go back and then regroup. And when they regroup, then they start planning what next action they're going to take. So that's exactly what's happening with me with this book. It's given me time to rethink, regroup, um, reorganize myself, which is really, really achieving amazing results. And then I, I can clearly say what this space once this book is done, because there's a lot already happening in my life, which I am hoping that you are getting the same out of this. So God has a purpose behind every suffering. So me going through all those difficult times, um, a bigger purpose has come out of it being this book that I'm reading, being this series of experiences that I'm having and all these amazing thoughts that are coming through my head right now. So he uses circumstances to develop our character. So when things that are not happening the way we want them to happen, which is when we want to control our lives, then things happen completely away from that. And when that happens, then you get so worried. And now what we're going to find out is there are different types of us. There are the ones who will go and seek knowledge, who will go and seek and try and find out why that has happened. And there are the, the, the ones who then, instead of doing that, get bitter, get upset, give up, and then get so stressed and things go wrong completely. So we're gonna try and see this sets of people. And, and the whole idea of this is to guide us to start thinking in the right, in the right path. Okay, so he uses circumstances to develop our character. In fact, he depends more on circumstances to make us like Jesus, than he depends on now reading the Bible. So it's not about just reading the Bible that he's expecting us to be like Jesus. 
it's about using the circumstances that we're faced with and these circumstances will then help to develop the character that we become and this is the character that he wants us to have for us to be a bit like Jesus so the reason is obvious and we face circumstances 24 hours a day so this is really immense and one thing I love about this book so much is the fact that it's so real if you just think about it a little bit it's an everyday life that is coming through this book and that's why I know I tried so many things I listened to so many tapes and CDs which I've shown you some of them on the screen um, I buy all kinds of personal development book this is the one book that's really really pulled it out for me in the bag it's pulled it so much like I can relate to things as they are happening he says in fact um, he depends more on circumstances to make us like Jesus and he depends on our, uh, okay than he than he depends on our reading the Bible so you hear most of us Christians who say to ourselves, oh yeah, I'm, I've read the Bible. And some of us will probably read it three, four, five times, read the whole Bible from chapter to chapter. But he's saying it is the way we handle circumstances that makes him understand how we are developing our character like Jesus did or like Jesus' character. And he says the reason is obvious because we face um, circumstances 24 hours a day. So every hour of our day every minute of our day every second of our day something is happening in our lives and it's those things that are happening in our lives that then begin to you know showcase who we become and it's who we become that he's really interested in um jesus warned us that we will have problems in the world and when i hear things like that i feel really comforted because lots of us think which one of the earlier sub, uh, chapters he did remind us that Anybody that thinks that they haven't got problems, they are lying. And it's so true. You see some friends, you see some distant people, and you just stay far away, you know, like I was saying to my daughter the other day. You think the grass is greener on the other side. And uh, there was a little quote that I read somewhere. It says, no, the grass is not greener. It's either they water that grass every day, or they are using AstroTurf. And AstroTurf is this kind of thing that looks like grass, but it's always green. So if they've got that in their garden, you think, oh yeah, their grass is green all the time, which is their life is perfect and yours is not. But no, either they are covering, they're covering their problems and not letting anyone know, or they are managing it somehow without you having to know. So it, we face circumstances every day and Jesus has clearly warned us that we're not going to have a trouble-free life, that there will be problems in our lives. So now, this is why I love this chapter so much. It's really bringing us to understand why do we have problems? And if there are problems, how do we handle them? So no one is immune. No one is immune to pain or insulated from suffering. And no one gets to skate through life problem free. None of us. You know, when you immune somebody, you give them an injection and they don't feel ill. None of us has, have been immune from problems. And none of us are going to ride on that roller skates. You know, the roller skates that just takes you on um, uh, on a ski path and you just roll. No, no, none of us are going to roll through life problem free. So every one of us are going to face problems. So this is one thing you must take on. Take it on from zero. And this is what I tell my children all the time. Because my one of my biggest dreams of doing this program is so that as they are growing up too, when they are going to deal with problems, they will look back on this and say, mom did a great job by advising us way ahead of time. We are all going to deal with problems. Nobody's immune from it. And so he's going to be telling us now how we can handle them. And so life is a series of problems. If you to chat with us, feel free to send us messages. Give us a big shout out if you are there looking at us because we, we enjoy the fact that you're there with us and you know this is making it quite interesting and exciting for me again usually i say thank you so much for all our viewers especially um those those of our um our subscribers on youtube who are really being part of this um, one of my biggest dreams is for all of us to share this experience such that whatever we take on now from this time on we can handle them because um i had i had a workshop the other day where i had to give a talk and everybody's worried about how to get started into the um, social media world and how what should they be expecting and how do they handle them 
and one of the biggest things that came out is if you're looking at this thing and thinking um, you're going to be this darling of everybody where nobody was going to hate you, nobody's going to give you negative comments, then you're making a big mistake. You're going to have to deal with that because that's just the way life is. And so all the all our subscribers who've been there with us and supporting us and, and we just want to share a part of us with you, something that anything that helps us, we want to help you with it. And that's why this whole program is being uh, documented for you so that whenever you're going through those difficult times which we've been told now that it is going to happen whether we like it or not you can always look back and say yes this lady was ahead of time for us i want to be ahead of time for you and and a big thank you to you that's why we're doing this so that you are there with us and we can skate whatever these problems are together okay so he says no one is immune to pain or insulated from suffering and no one can can get to skate through life problem free life is a series of problem every time you solve one another one is waiting to take its place now isn't that interesting every time we solve one problem another one is waiting to take its place so this is where again lots of us who sit there and think that oh yeah but life is meant to be easy or you're thinking oh i'm gonna finish by the time i get to the age of 30 i would have finished sorting out all my problems or maybe by the time I get to 50, my life will be perfect. I know I was one of them. I thought, yeah, by now I should be in control of everything that's happening to me. And that's why when I realized this wasn't what the case was going to be, I had to find a solution. And this has given me so much answers. So none of us are immune from this thing. The minute we finish solving one problem, another one will replace it. I know I read a book somewhere where the, the book did say that um, um, when you when you demand something, when you want something, you know, like when you achieved one and you then you want another, that just that's just the way we grow. That's just growth. And so we, we think um, then it, it, they call it desire. It says, no, we should continue to have these desires because the desires is what actually gets the world going. The more desires you have, the more you expand, the more things grow, the more we bring new things into the world. So we should never tell ourselves, oh, but I've had enough now, let me go and rest and sleep. But now we're not talking about you just dreaming of something and saying, why don't I get another, why don't I get another? Let's say you have one car, I want another car, or um, you have a house, I want another house. That's not where we are. Where we are now is problems will always come, whether we like it or not. And the minute you finish solving one, another one will take its place. That's what this book is telling us. So not all of them are big though. Not all the problems you deal with are big. But all are significant in God's growth process for you. So we're going to find out now that why, why are there problems. So he says all of the problems we encounter and experience are significant in God's growth pro, um, um, process for us. So god has it in place so that we can grow to the next stage so peter assures us that problems are normal peter is telling us that problems are normal and he was saying don't be bewildered or surprised when you go through the fiery trials ahead for this is no strange unusual thing that is going to happen to you so whenever we're going through problems it is not strange we shouldn't be bewildered. We shouldn't be like, oh my goodness, you know, like surprised, like shocked, like, whoa, what is this? No, we shouldn't be like that because this is not strange. It is only normal that these things are happening. So God uses problems to draw us closer to himself. And I thought that was really interesting. God uses problems to draw us closer to himself. The Bible says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed in spirit. And so whenever things are really down, which I know how down I was before I took on this book, I felt so low. You know, like deep in you, you feel so empty, like a part of you has, like a hole has been put in your heart. And there's so many people out there who are going through that. That's the people they call low in spirit. So God stands there for those kind of people. He says he, will, he, he, um, he is close to the brokenhearted when your heart feels lost and when your spirit feels 
crushed. He is there for you. And so our most profound and intimate experience of worship will likely be our darkest days. So when these things are really, really down and we are just completely out of it, he says that's when we bring out our, um, our most intimate experience of worship. So when we're really down, that's when we feel really, really close to God. That's when we ask questions, very intimate questions. Now, where are you? Why are you letting me go through this? And you know, all the usual things that happen to us. Remember the story I told about a lady who um, just, uh, she was a celebrity here in the UK and she never really believed in God. And then they, they discover she had cancer. I think cancer of the uterus. So. Can't remember, cervical cancer. And she then, openly now said she wanted her children to be baptized in church she never wanted to hear about god all along while she was going crazy so that's the intimate moment when things are extremely dark he says that's when we speak our hearts to our god he says when our heart is broken that's when we do that when we feel abandoned that's when we do that when we are out of options it feels like there's no way out of this that's when we get closest to god when the pain is so great and we turn to God alone. Because at those moments we remember, we always remember no matter how much we claim that, oh yeah, but you know, I don't even know how Big Bang Theory, blah. You know, we tell there are people who just enjoy doing those kind of things. But when you have those darkest moments, that's when we turn to God. And that's when our, our, our you know, deepest thoughts are fully with God. Say it is during suffering that we learn to pray our most authentic. So when we're praying, you know, like when things are okay and we pray to God, most times we're not even thinking about, oh God, you know, some things, oh, thank you for this food, amen. You know, you just, you just flip through it. You're not thinking, you just, you just feel like it's a chore. But when things are really down, your prayers are real. And so you see why it is, necessary that we have problems from time to time because those problems draw us closer to God just let us go crazy on this earth and think that oh yeah there's nothing I have no worries no there are times you will have worry and this is where we're going to find the two types of people there are the ones who instead of getting stronger and getting closer to God will go deeper and fall deep into the pit and there are those who will now say yes there is God please pull me out of this pit. So when we're in pain, we don't have the energy for superficial prayers. So when we're in pain, there's no energy for us to just tell tales. So, you know, well, I just wanted to say this to you, Father, but you know, I really can't be bothered. No, now you're in pain, your prayer is directed. Your prayer is clear. Your prayer is focused. Your needs are extremely clear. And so it says, there's a man called Johnny Urexin. Tada, and he notes when life is rosy, we may slide by with knowing about Jesus, with imitating him and quoting him and speaking of him. But only in suffering will we know Jesus. It's only when we're really in suffering that we know him. But when everything is rosy, we just slide by him. We learn things about God in suffering that we can't learn any other way. So when we're really in pain, when things are really down, you know, broken hearted, um, low in spirit, all kinds of things have pulled us down. That's when we really, really, really learn about God because there's no other way. There's no other way. You see, God could have kept Joseph out of jail. You remember the story of Joseph when um, his brother sold him, they, they, they dropped him in the pit and then he got picked up and taken to Egypt and he ended up in prison and then eventually he had a dream and then um, uh, Pharaoh brought him out and he became the governor or second in command. He was some, He becomes this huge person there. He says God could have left him in jail but no, he could have kept Daniel out of the lion's den God has the power. He could have kept Jeremiah from being tossed into um, a slimy pit. He could have kept Paul from shipwrecked three times and kept the three Hebrews, um, Hebrew young men from being thrown into the blazing furnace. But no, he didn't. So here he's just given examples of where people have always been in their lowest times. 
I think he probably forgot to even add Job. There's so many stories in the Bible where people have been at their lowest and God comes to rescue. So he let those problems happen and every one of those persons were drawn closer to God as a result. So do you get the message here? Each time this thing happens and you run to God and he answers you and deals with this issue, what happens? You are closer. Because then you understand, you remember that, you know what, if it wasn't God who pulled me out, look at the miracle that happened. If it wasn't for him, what, where would I be? And then you have no choice but to be closer to God. And so problems force us to look to God and depend on him instead of ourselves. So when everything is rosy, we think we are in control. We think we have the power and though we don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want to hear anybody talk because in our head, we know what we're doing. But when the problem comes, that's when we run to God. And obviously when God stops it, we stay closer. That doesn't mean that everybody does that. Of course, there are the ones who after God's answer and they're out of it, then they forget again. Paul testifies to this. We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God who alone can save us. So when Paul had problems and he said, you know, he actually thought he was doomed to die and he felt so powerless. But then what they then did was they just handed over everything to God and said, you should take care of this. And when he answered it, they knew that there was no one else that could save them. It had to be God. And so he said, you'll never know that God is all you need until God is all you've got. And I felt this was such a great statement. You will never know that God is all you need until you know that God is all you've got. So when you've been thrown into that deep end, when there's no other source, there's no other hope anywhere else, generally we know that there's no one else that could deal with our issues. And then it's only God. And that's when we realize that he's everything that we've got. And so regardless of the cause, none of your problems could happen without God's permission. So whatever it is we're dealing with, we will really not be dealing with it without God knowing that it's going to happen. And now he wants to know how we can cope with it. So everything that happens to a child of God is father filtered and he intends to use it for good. Even when Satan and others mean it for bad. So whenever things happen to us, God has filtered it. He knows it's going to happen. I mean, in one of the chapters, we were told clearly from the day we, before we were even um, uh, uh, in our mother's womb, God already has written our life out. He knows our very beginning to the end. He has the answers to everything that we are. And so before these problems happen, he knows about it. And so he's filtered it. He's watching to see how we are going to react to it. But it's always for his good. It's always to eventually come out for good. And I know that most of us, whenever we're going through these problems, we always get so angry, we query, we are upset, we're wondering where is God when this is happening to me. But he says it's always for good. He's always going to turn that problem around to create good. And because God is sovereign, sovereignly in control, accidents are just incidents in God's good plans for us. So because God is in control, accidents, things that could have gone really crazy, are just an incident for God, for God's good plans for us. So because every day of our life was written on God's calendar before we were born, he just mentioned that, everything that happens to us has spiritual significance. So because it's already been written, everything that happens to us has a spiritual significance. So there's a reason behind things happening. And it's not just a reason, but there's a spiritual reason for it. So we know that God causes everything to work together for good. For good, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. And this is a good passage from Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 29. He explains, we know that God causes everything to work together 
for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. So God knows who you are in advance and he has chosen you. So for everyone who's taking time to sit down and watch this book, this program that we're reading through and the time we're all spending here looking at this, God has already chosen you to listen to this. I would never have known that God has chosen me to read this book. So for everything we do, there is a spiritual significance. So yes, I would have been going, I mean, further down, this comes up. I've been going through a really terrible time and things haven't been working for me the way I was hoping for. And I felt so bad and I chose this book to pick and read. And that's how the spiritual significance comes out of it. Because my terrible time has turned out to have an amazing spiritual significance. I'm reading a book that's here helping as many people as possibly can. And so we need to understand this passage very clearly. And what he's trying to do now is he's going to break it down one piece at a time. So he, he, he does not say God causes everything to work out the way I want it to. He, do, he does not say God causes everything to work out to have a happy ending on earth. So these are the things he's reminding. God did not say I'm going to make everybody have such an amazing happy ending. No. He didn't say everything is going to work out the way we want it. No, it's not about us. We live in a fallen, in a fallen world. And wow, that is something. Because you remember the story of Genesis where Adam and Eve fell out of glory with God. So that's what created this world to be fallen. And that's why there will always be pain. This is why there will always be worries and, you know, sadness and things that are out of our control. So, but that, that's not the end of it. Only in heaven is everything done perfectly the way God intends. So here on earth, because it's a fallen world, things will not always be perfect. But it's only in heaven that things are going to be the way God wants them to be. And this is why we are told to pray. You remember the, the, the Lord's prayer? He says, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what that passage says, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's just trying to remind us that, yes, earth wasn't meant to be perfect. And it's not perfect. But the only place that's perfect is in heaven. And that's what we're told in that, in that, um, in that prayer verse, that will be done as it is in heaven. So it is perfect in heaven. So we're hoping it can bring it here on earth as well. And so to fully understand Romans 8.28, we must consider it phrase by phrase. And so he starts breaking them down. The first part was, we know. Remember I said, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. So we're going to break this passage into little bits. And the first one we're looking at now is, we know. So he said, we know, I hope it's diffi in difficult times, it's not based on positive thinking. So when things are difficult, it's not about positive thinking. Oh yeah, you know what, I'll just think so positively. I've been through all of that. Remember I did NLP, where all we do is talk positively. Make sure that you talk positively, you attract the right things and everything's happening perfectly. I did all of that and my heart was still in trouble, in turmoil. I couldn't find, I still was searching. You remember when I keep talking about that book, Man's Search for Meaning, that's how it's always been for me. I still want to know why things are happening the way they're happening to me. I was, I was completely confused. In as much as I knew all these amazing theories of NLP and motivation and personal development and attracting the right people and the right friends and all the things that you can imagine he says that this is not about that this is not about you know positive thinking this is not about wishful thinking or natural optimism because that's what we all do when we're in that, in that frame of mind we are all these amazing experts no the work of god is not based on that it is a certainty based on the truth that God is in complete control of our universe and that he loves us. So it's about God and his message through us and the fact that he loves us. 
And so many places have confirmed that to us in, the, in this book. He says, and the next one was that God causes. Remember the first one was we know. And it's not about positively thinking or wishful thinking or optimism. Now the next one is that, that God causes. There's a grand designer and designer design behind everything. There's a grand design behind everything. Your life is not a result of random chance, fate or luck. That's what he's telling us. Our life is not by fate. It's not by some luck that we're just here. There's a master plan. History is his story. So history that we're dealing with God is God's story, his story. God is pulling the strings. So whenever things are happening in our lives and we are beginning to query and wondering why is it, God is pulling the strings. He knows why these things are happening. We make mistakes, but God never does. Humans that we are, we are prone to making mistakes all the time. But God never makes mistakes. God cannot make a mistake because he is God. So the next stage was everything. God's plan for your life involves all that happens to you. God's plan for all of us involves everything that happens to us. And so even when I'm having all these issues I've been dealing with, that's God's plans for me. And whatever issues you are dealing with at the moment, God has that plan for you. Including your mistakes, including your hurts. So every time you're hurting, God has that plan. Including your sins, things that we, the sins that we commit without us knowing, God has that plan. It includes illness. It includes debts. You know, when you owe people, and I should know about that. It includes disasters. It includes divorce. So when husband and wife, you've had enough, you're fighting every minute of the day. You know what? I hate you. You hate me. That's it. Let's park ways. It's in God's plans. It includes death of loved ones. Again, since we started this program, we lost some someone really dear to us in the family. That's death, and we miss him so much. But that's all in God's plans. God can bring good out of the worst evil, he says. He did this at Calvary. And we all know the story. So Jesus was now posed, um, you know, taunted and spat out and beaten and with nails in his grand, uh, hands and, and feet. And he all came out for good. You know, so to work together, not separately or independently. The events in your life work together in God's plans. So everything that we're going through is happening together for God's plans. They are not isolated acts, but interdependent parts of the process to make you like Jesus Christ. So all these things that we're experiencing are not isolated. It's just aimed at making us gain that character that Jesus had. So to bake a cake, we must use flour, we must use salt, we must use raw eggs, we must use sugar, we must use oil. Eating the ingredients individually, they are tasteless and disgusting, or distasteful, he said. But bake them together and they become delicious. So that's what this is all about. So when we give God all our distasteful, unpleasant experiences, he blends them, bakes them together, and they turn out for good. So individual experiences, let's say the sugar, let's say the salt, let's say the flour, let's say the oil. Individually, you cannot just take oil and start drinking, or take flour and start chewing, or take salt and just licking, or sugar. But when they put it all together, it creates an amazing thing called cake. Extremely delicious. So every problem we're dealing with, individually, they're nasty and they hurt us and want to cry, and want to give up, want to go crazy. But when God brings them all together, at the end, it creates something good. That's what he's trying to remind us here. And so, when we give God all our distasteful, unpleasant experiences, he blends them together and creates something good out of it. So we're going to the next stage. He says, for the good. This does not say that everything in life is good. Remember, we live in a falling world. Much of what happens in our life is evil and bad, but specializes in bringing good out of it. 
So things that are happening to us most times are bad, really bad. But in the end, they are coming for good. And God's purpose is greater than our problems, than our pains, than even our sin. It is about building our character. That's what God's purpose in our life is all about. And I, and I had a moment of reflection after reading this, and I thought, oh my goodness. We're looking at character building. And we, we you know, I've mentioned this a few times. It's not about us. Part of, there's a chapter we read and it says, our life is not about us. And I think the sooner we get that message, the better our life will begin to, to start, you know, pan out. It's about the mission. It's about the message that he sent us through. And you know, whenever I have a message to share, I come out and I share it. Because I know that message did not just pop in my head. There's a reason that message came. So that's what it is. It's about us sharing, and, you know, delivering the mission that he sent us for. And so the reason for our life is not just come here and have fun. So of those who love God and are called, this promise is only for God's children. It is not for everyone. So again, this is where we need to start looking now. So we've understood now that the world is not the greatest there is, that things, bad things are meant to happen and all kinds of things are, are, are going on in the world. We live in a fallen world. But it is down to us now to choose. Where do we want to belong? Do we want to just hang in there and deal with the pain and not know where to run to when there's a desperate time or crisis? Or do we know now that there's a place to go, which is when everything else fails, we know that there is God. I mean, there's a way he put it, he put it here very nicely, which I, I think I read that earlier. You will never know that God is all you need until God is all you've got. So this is where we need to start thinking as people. He said, all things work for bad for those living in opposition to God and insist on having their way. Remember we said there are two, there are two types of us. The ones who, when things are wrong, things are bad, we're wrong, we know where to go. There's nowhere else to go but to God. And there are those who don't want to hear it. I want to take control of this. It's my life. This is where we're getting all wrong. The life we have is not ours. And this is why we come and go constantly. If it was our life, people with lots of money would buy their time here and would never go anywhere. They will be here. Because somehow in our head as human, we think this is all that is great. We, pro we, we don't know what the next phase is. But so while we are here, naturally, lots of people think this is the perfect thing to, to deal with. And so these two choices of who we are, the ones that when things are down, we run to God. And then the ones who say, don't tell me about any God. I don't want to hear it. I am going to take control of this situation. He said, all things work for bad for those living in opposition of God and insist on having things their own way. Bible said Jesus learned obedience through suffering and was made perfect through suffering. So Jesus suffered so much and he learned obedience from there. And he was made perfect from suffering, from dealing with suffering Jesus became a perfect person. And so, why would God exempt us from what he allowed his own son to experience? So that's a big question. So this is what people tell me. These days, when, okay, obviously based on reading this book, when people tell me, oh, and I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling with that. So first thing I say, are you a Christian? They go, yes. I say, but Jesus struggled so much on the cross. Jesus went through so much before he got there and then he was eventually killed. So if Jesus could go through that, I don't know what makes you the next Christian to think that you're going to go through life skates free. And now we're learning so much. We're learning to understand that suffering is just part of life. And Paul said, we go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. So remember how you ended up. In the end, Jesus rode to heaven and he's sitting on the hand of the Father. And from there, he will call us to. So if we can handle the problems of this world and take it on, head on the way God wants us to handle it, there's hope for us. It means that the same way Jesus struggled here and eventually ended up in a good place, we're all going to end up in a good place. 
So responding to problems as Jesus would. That's the next up title. Problems that automatically produce what God intends. This is where he's beginning to explain to us now better. Yes, the whole idea is to bring us closer to God. And then yes, it's to bring God's perfect idea into the world. Yes, but what's happening here? Not all the time we go through problems do everybody run to God to allow his purpose to happen. And so many people become bitter rather than better. And they never grow up. And I know so many people who are going through this. I know so many people who are having divorce issues. And what happens? Okay, it's over. You finally agree. That's it. We're not going to. That's it. You go your way. I go my way. But these people are still extremely bitter. They just want to hurt each other constantly. So if you agree, that's it. It's over. Why do we have to still hold so much in our heart and hurt each other continuously? This is what is happening. It says it does not always bring an end, a good end to these problems. People become bitter rather than better. You know, problems are meant to make us better just like Jesus went. He was made perfect from suffering. So we're meant to go, go better when we suffer. But no, it ends up making some of us extremely bitter, making some of us become children we never grow up. And so we have to respond the way Jesus would. We need to wake up from that. We need to realize that it is not by reacting and becoming bitter that these problems come into our life. We've learned from all this whole chapter that problems are meant to be there. We are meant to be better than the problems. So remember that God's plan is good. So whenever things happen, God has a better plan for it. Remember the case of the cake, flour, salt, sugar, and how he puts it all together and becomes amazing cake. So that's how each of our problems will eventually be put together to give us a better hope. So God knows what is best for us and has our best interest at heart. God told Jeremiah, the plans I have for you are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. They are plans to give you hope and plans to give you a future. So that's the plan God has for us. The plan to prosper us, not to harm us. So yes, we've been told there will always be problems. But in the end, it is not meant to destroy us. It's meant to help us grow and be better people. Joseph understood this truth when he told his brothers who had sold him to slavery. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. So Joseph ended up in the right place. Meanwhile, his brothers who sold him wanted him to be destroyed. Hezekiah echoed the same sentiments about his life-threatening illness. It was for my own good that I had such hard times. So in the end, he had such a good time because he had a very difficult time. It eventually turned out to be good. Whenever God says no to your request for relief, remember God is doing what is best for us, training us to live God's holy best. It is vital that we stay focused on God's plan, not our pain or our problem. So we should stay focused on God's plan, not focused on our pain and our problem. We should keep asking God, what is coming out of this? What do you want to make out of this thing that you're pulling me through? You want to know where this is going. Maybe you want to know, maybe you're curious enough, but that's the whole point. It's getting somewhere. And this somewhere that is going is for your good. If you allow it to flow, if you don't become bitter inside, if you don't get so hot that you don't want to hear anything else and block yourself from the world. If it, this is how Jesus endured the cross. And we are urged to follow his examples. So it's always all of that pain ends up for good. Keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and instructor. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be afterwards. So he died a shameful death on the cross for us. And Corey Ten Boom, someone he's referring to, who suffered in a Nazi, Nazi death camp, explained the power of focus. He says, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. This person was in the Nazi uh, death camp. 
You say, if we look at the world constantly, we'll be distressed. That's just the way it is. If you look within, you'll be distressed. So if you look inside you based on what you've seen in the world, you will be distressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. So when you look at Christ with all the pains he went through, you realize that your pain is nothing compared. And then peace will come unto you. It says your, feel, your focus will determine your feelings. So where you look will help to create how you feel. Remember, you look at the world, you feel distressed. You look at your inside, you feel distressed. And you look at Christ and you feel at rest. So where your focus is going is how you're going to feel. And so the secret of endurance is to remember that your pain is temporary. That's the secret of endurance. You know what? I can endure this. I can endure this. Why? Because it's temporary. This is not going to last forever. The secret of it is to remember that your pain is temporary, but your reward will be eternal. So you may be going all through all this very difficult time, but you know that at the end of this difficult time, just like Jesus knew, there will be an amazing reward that comes out of it. Moses endured a life of problems because he was looking ahead for his reward. Remember the story of Moses, how he struggled to get the children out of Egypt. He knew that at the end of it all, God was going to be there for him. Paul endured hardship the same way. He said, our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us an immeasurable great glory that will last forever. So whatever these problems that you are facing, they are not meant to last forever. They are not meant to last forever. I, I went through all these difficult times and now I'm reading a book that's clearing my heart. I feel so much lighter. And don't give up to short term thinking. So don't worry about, okay, I'm just thinking about this problem right now. Don't give in to it. Stay focused on the end result. If we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. We've been told that before. And what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. So rejoice and give thanks. The Bible tells us to give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. How is this possible? Notice that God tells us to give thanks in all circumstances. Not for all circumstances. So God tells us, give thanks in all circumstances. He didn't say, for all circumstances. God doesn't expect us to be thankful for evil. So he's not saying, oh yeah, when there's evil, go and jump with joy or for sin, or for suffering, or for their painful um, um, consequences in the world. Instead, God wants us to thank him that he will use our problems to fulfill his purpose. He will use our problems to fulfill his purpose. And um, like I said before, this is just how it happened for me. If I had everything I wanted, I had the most amazing home, I never moved town, um, my business was just, money was flowing in every day and I didn't have to preach so much to explain to people that you need a skill that will last you for life and my husband was this super, you know what they say, um, um, no perfect man, this super perfect man and there was nothing ever to worry about. I probably would never have looked for a book like this to read. I would never be sitting in front of you here now and chatting with you about life. And so he is saying to us, God wants us to thank him that he will use our problems to fulfill his purposes. So the problems I've encountered, all the issues I've dealt with, is not brought me here where I'm reading this book to understand life more. And you see how everything works for good. I will not be sitting up, um, setting up a book club, which I intend to do, because once this is all over, now this has given me an amazing experience. I want, I, I would like to share more books, so many books that I have. I like to share it with people who want to listen. Because I know people struggle to pick up books to read. And even when they do, they struggle with the meaning or the understanding of them. And some people don't even want to pick up 
five dollars or five pounds to go and buy a book that's too much money to spend so i am happy to just like we're doing now sit down and read books to you i will not be understanding life the way we now do indeed um in our circumstances we have to give him thanks the lord may be too heavy to carry but if you call on him he will open your eyes and show you the right paths there is really no need to be bitter and broken when things go against your wishes in life and that's what's happening to most of us. We just, we just store it up and store it up and store it. And there are, there are those who don't even say anything to anybody. And the next thing, they're falling into depression. They don't want to share it at all. Because they think it's only happening to them. But it's happening to everybody. My mom struggled with polygamous uh, 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 marriage. And in the end, died from it. My sister struggled with a very bad marriage as well. And so I am not about to go through the same experience in life. And so when I, be, I started having problems in marriage, I had to find a way to deal with it. The same thing I wish for everyone out there. Overcome whatever circumstances you're struggling with by seeking God first. Because when I did speak to God, obviously every time I struggle with anything, there's no other place I go than to talk to God. Because um, I don't have brothers at all right now. My brothers are, are all late. And so, um, not naturally, people go, oh, then I ran to my brother and I told him how I felt. And most of my sisters, they never really understand what I experienced. Or, you know, like, if I'm trying to explain how I feel about something, they see another side of it. And so I tend to just, my answers come from books. And I happen to have a husband who really doesn't understand the way I raise it. And so most times we don't share our thoughts together. And so when I have issues, I run to a book. And so if you are struggling with anything, this is how you deal with it. Remember somewhere they said loneliness is one of the things you're going to deal with in life. And you're going to deal with criticisms. And you're going to deal with people, you know, throwing things at you and calling you names. And, you know, all the things, that, rejection, stress, all these things are just parts of life. But it's not for you to be bitter and sad. It's for you to find solutions. It's for you to find a way out. And when you do, where do you go? You go to God. And God opens your eyes and gives you answers. And I would thank him so much for giving me this answer of this book. Because like I said, so many things are coming out behind the back of this. And so the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. He doesn't say rejoice over your pain. That is masochism. You rejoice in the Lord no matter what is happening. You can rejoice in God's love, in God's care, in God's wisdom, in God's power, and in God's faithfulness. Because there's always an answer. Jesus said, be full of joy at that time because you have a great reward waiting for you in heaven. We can also rejoice in knowing that God is going through the pain with us. So whatever the pain you are experiencing, God is going through it with you. Um, we do not serve a distant and detached God who spouts encouraging cliches safely from the sideline. So he doesn't just sit in the far distance and say, oh, don't worry about it. Um, just do this and just do that. He actually speaks through us. He walks through us. And I know that one for a fact. Because I get answers to, so, to, you know, to problems. The minute I speak to God, a voice answers me. And that's why I believe wholeheartedly in what I'm reading and what I'm chatting with you about. He enters our suffering. Jesus did it in the in incarnation and his spirit does it in us right now. Jesus is with us. God will never leave us on our own. That's one thing we really need to know. If we come to him. Because remember he said, for as long as we reject him, then... He's not going to go chasing you. He gives us every opportunity to come to him. Remember the sledgehammer and then the jackhammer and all the hammers. Each time things are happening, just take this from this video today. Each time things are happening is a message for you to go, you know what? I've had enough father talk to me. Because he wants to mold a character out of you. He wants a perfect character out of you. And so if you keep resisting it, then there's nothing he can do. He just has to, he finds a way to pull you back. And I know that. 
because that's how I've been pulled back from so many things. Before I got into this role of working with, you know, hair and all that, I was in telecoms. I've done banking, I've done legal, I've done different things and it was okay. Life was normal until I lost the job. That was one of the first stages. Oh yeah, you're happy? Okay. I want a different character from you. Boom, the job went. Boom, the house went. And then it started going. Instead, he enters into our suffering. Jesus did it in the incarnation and his spirit does it in us now. God will never leave us on our own. Refuse to give up. God says we should never give up. So being bitter is not a good sign. Be patient and be persistent. Keep talking. I mean, I never stopped talking to God. Like now I've happily started, you remember I did say I was going to start taking on um, early morning jogs. I've started doing it. And each time I'm on my own doing my jogging, I'm constantly chatting with him and I'm saying, lead me on this path. Tell me where you want me to go. The Bible says, let the process go on until your endurance is fully developed. Until you know what it means to just be patient with God. And you will find that you have become men of mature character with no weak spots. So that's what he's expecting from us. He wants us to be mature because we've experienced all types of suffering. Character building is a slow process. It doesn't just happen overnight. And so whenever we try to avoid or escape the difficulties, whenever we try to avoid or escape the difficulties in life, we short circuit the process. We short circuit it. It's like when you take a shortcut, you know, that's a long road and maybe there's traffic. Oh yeah, I found another shorter route and you go boom. And you're hoping that you're going to cut across everyone else. When we do that, we short circuit the, pro the process and then we delay our growth. And we actually end up with a worse kind of pain. The worthless type that accompany, accompanies denial and avoidance. And so whenever we have issues, whenever we are dealing with problems, whenever we're struggling, what we then do is we want to short circuit the process. We want to make it short, quick. And so we find a way we, we don't want to handle that issue. And when we do that, what happens? We end up with a bigger problem, a worse kind of pain, a worthless type, um, the kind of pain that's worthless. And that's because we lived in denial and avoidance. And I found this really interesting as well. Because when we're in denial and avoidance, these are the things that happen. When we have problems, instead of taking it to God to guide us through this world, um, through his word, which is the bride of life, through his grace, which is love, through his miracles, which is relationships with other people, through talking to other people sent by God, which is where that relationship comes from, we take rules into our own hands. We impact revenge. And that's where the bitterness comes in. We hide in various things. And so lots of people, you find they're struggling with problems, they start taking drugs. They start having alcohol over um, abuse. We start womanizing for men. We start prostituting for women. And then the next thing, we're creating divorce scenarios. We forget to take the problem from its root cause. We, we, we stubbornly refuse to find out the reason behind this big problem that we're dealing with. No, we, we, we short circuit it. We think it's something that's just peripheral, is at the top, is at the surface. Let's just skim it. And so when we do that, we end up in bigger problems. That's what he said. And these things don't give us happiness in the end. No matter all these other short, short things we're thinking of. You know, for a man, let me go have five other girlfriends. My wife is giving me a problem at home. Maybe this woman will make me happy. All you end up having is more problems. Oh, let me take as much drugs as possible. When I'm high, I won't remember the problem. When you're low, you need more drugs. Same thing with alcohol. Yeah, that for that moment you're high, you don't remember you had any issue. The day it's so when you're sober, you're back to zero. And so these are the things they call shortcuts. The minute we keep running to these shortcuts and avoiding dealing with it right from the roots, what led to this problem? It will not be a lot easier. It will not be easy. 
They don't give us happiness. The problem is still there. We spend our years on earth wasted instead of building a healthier character. And truth is, everybody experiences problem. But not everybody handles their problem the same way. So again, like we started and we said, the grass is greener on the other side. Everybody is experiencing a problem. It is the way life is. So the sooner we accept that all of us, the better for all of us. When we grab the eternal consequences of our character development, we'll pray fewer. We won't be praying all the time again because now we know what we're supposed to be doing. You, you will not be saying, comfort me prayers, which is help me feel good, God. And we'll, more be, we'll be doing more of conform me, which is use this to make me more like you. So whenever things are happening, we are okay with it. We say to God, yes, walk with me. Make me understand why this is happening. Your problems are not personal. They are a test that we must overcome. Everyone experiences this test and will be strong enough to handle it into God's glory. You know you are maturing when you begin to see the hand of God in the random baffling and um, uh, seemingly pointless circumstances of life. You're maturing when you start to see God's hand in everything around you. So some of the things you think, oh yeah, but that's so sim you know, that that's so pointless. But God's hands in it. Last problems are actually God's opportunities to work with us. And so it's time to allow God to use you to his glory. Tell your story, help someone learn from you and become strong instead of breaking apart and being this helpless person. So whenever you're having these issues which Lots of people are having, I know one of my friends at the moment and she's having, she's going through cancer problem uh, treatment and she's, she's, um, she's uh, telling, um, um, recording it all the time now on, on Facebook and letting everyone in her group know what she's experiencing. So now if the next person uh, um, happened to have similar illness, you will know that she was strong enough to handle it. And so the same applies to all of us. Is that, you know, the, one of the chapters was like, everybody pretends that the, theirs, theirs is so great. No, I can happily see here and I tell you, mine is not. And these are the things I'm dealing with. And when I do that, I want you to understand that, yes, whatever it is you're going through, is not the worst one as well. You can remind yourself, if Joy can handle it, why can I not handle what I'm going through? And that's why we share our experiences in life. And one of the biggest things that I've come to take out of all of this is this life is not mine. I'm here just on a mission. I'm here with a message. And the message is if I have to share with you anything I'm experiencing that would normally otherwise make me bitter and because I've shared it, I'm free, then I will do that. And then I'll, I'll save the life. Because when you hear it and you are struggling, you will come out of it too. So problems are nothing to be ashamed of. They are opportunities to help and contribute to other people's lives. If you are facing trouble right now, don't ask, why me? That's what he said. Don't ask yourself, why am I going through this problem? You see, when we do that, what I see is we personalize our life. And one of the chapters is, it is not about you. Your life is not about you. Because if your life was about you, you would take, you have control of when it should be over. You will not be sitting helpless and not even know that, okay, you know, well, I don't know maybe when, when is my life. No. If your life was about you, you would know the beginning and you would know the end. You would know how it's going to be. You would know your every day. This is what my day should be like. Um, and then circumstances won't fall out of your control. But no. It does fall out of control. We don't know what's happening. You know, for a woman, for instance, when you get pregnant, you don't know what child you're going to have. Until you go to a hospital and say, okay, could you scan and tell me what sex my baby's going to be? God took everything into the future away from us because we're not meant to know. That, that should tell us that we have no control over who we are. And that's why we should not personalize our life. Our life is not about us. And so when we have problem also, it is not about us. These problems are, are meant to help us build who we are. So instead of, <clears throat> instead of ask, uh, what do you want me to, instead ask, 
no the what he was saying was if you are facing trouble right now don't ask why me instead ask what do you want me to learn from this so whenever you're having any issues what well, you should be asking god what message is in this problem what am i supposed to be learning out of it then trust god and keep on doing what is right keep doing the right thing so again, a good example is what I've been through. I've asked, what am I supposed to be picking out of this? And then the next thing I'm reading this book. So I keep reading it. That's why I'm committed to the 40 days. You need to stick it out, staying with God. Staying with God's plan so you'll be there for the promised completion. So we're going to stick out this 40 days program by God's grace. Don't give up, grow up. That's a big message. We should not give up. We should rather grow up. So learn from your circumstances. Educate other people who are ignorant about it. And create a stronger, better society. Your problem is your power. This is because you will stay strong and overcome it. You then become stronger. You create a stronger <coughs> character from the problem that you experience. And so this, this is some of the quotes that I remember looking at this. It says, when the going gets tough, only the tough get going. So that tells you that you're meant to be tough. You're meant to overcome this problem. Because the problem is getting tough, only tough people overcome it. And so when you're dropped in the sea, generally, we either sink or swim. And so when you swim, that means you've overcome the problem. But when you sink, you've, you've, di you've died with the problem. You become depressed, you become bitter, you become sad, you don't want to wake up, you don't want to talk to people. That's what happens when we allow problems to overpower us. So, um, here we are, I think we've come to the end of this chapter. But before we go, as usual, we just read um, the usual questions. So first it says, consider this, there is a purpose behind every problem. And that was the first line we read. And then the question was, what problem in my life has caused the greatest growth for me? So that's what he's asking you. What problem, what did you experience that has actually catapulted you to the next stages of life? And I think for me, this whole experience has actually helped me to grow. And meditation, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And that's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So thank you so much for being part of this program. Thank you for listening to this whole chapter. It was long, but we knew it was going to be. And we look forward to seeing you in the next chapter. God bless you abundantly.